Welcome to the training module covering the test titled Evaluation of Crack Propagation Using the Semicircular Bin Test at Intermediate Temperature. This presentation was developed by the Technology Transfer and Training Section of the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. This training video will give you a basic understanding of the steps necessary to prepare a specimen for testing, age a specimen prior to testing, test a specimen at room temperature, and process the data upon completion of all tests. The semicircular bin test, also known as SCB, is a test run on 12 half moon shaped specimen at three notch depths. A fixed rate of motion, 0.02 inches per minute, is applied until the specimen fractures and fails. The resistance to cracking is calculated based on the combined results of the specimen tested at each notch depth. Let us get started and go through the steps. Needless to say, the first step in testing SCB specimen is sample preparation. Asphalt specimen are compacted to 7% plus or minus a 0.5% air voids utilizing a super paved gyratory compactor. Compact six specimen to a height of 60 millimeters each. Once the air void target has been achieved, it is time to cut each compacted specimen in half using a wet saw outfitted with a clamping system. The clamping system should be designed to accurately position the specimen in the center of the saw blade. It is important that each half of the specimen be the same size after cutting. Once all gyratory samples have been cut into two equal halves, it is time to create the notches required. Four specimen will be cut for each notch depth. The notch depths required are 25.4 millimeter, 31.8 millimeter, and 38.0 millimeters. All final notch depths have to be accurate to within one millimeter. The notch width is required to be three millimeters plus or minus 0.5 millimeters. It is a good practice to have a few dummy samples in order to verify your saw is cutting the correct depth. Make a few passes with the dummy sample to seed in your saw. After your saw is locked into the proper notch depth, Clamp the test specimen in place to ensure the notch is cut in the dead center. If the notch location varies from specimen to specimen, you will most likely have a high variability in your test results. Notch location, notch depth, and notch alignment are critical to achieving repeatable results. Make the notch cuts to all of the specimen, verifying the depth after each cut. After all of the samples have been properly notched and labeled, it is time to begin with the aging process. The aging process is performed in accordance with AASHTO R30 procedure for long-term aging of compacted mixtures. According to the test procedure, the notched specimens are aged in a convection oven at 85 degrees Celsius continuously for five days. Place the specimens on a tray or other rigid surface that will prevent any slumping during aging. It is best to put the specimens on their side during the aging process to help prevent damage. The specimens should not touch one another. After the five day aging period, allow the specimens to cool to room temperature before handling them. Measure and record the specimens notch depth, notch width, thickness, and diameter, each in three different locations. A measurement worksheet is available through LTRC or on the LTRC website. Once you have measured all of the specimens and verified that the samples are within tolerance after aging, it is time to begin the test procedure. Let's discuss the equipment necessary to run an SCB test. You will need a loading test machine, a measurement recording system, a real-time display for displaying test data, a three-point loading frame, an environmental chamber, and friction-reducing membranes. The testing machine should be a closed loop system capable of running at a fixed rate of 0.02 inches per minute, 0.5 millimeters per minute, regardless of the loads endured during the test. The machine should be built strong enough to withstand any deformation during testing. The measurement recording system is usually part of the testing machine. 
it shall include a data acquisition system capable of accepting a digital input for storage and analysis. It must be capable of recording load, displacement, and time at a rate of one measurement per second. The measurement recording system should be able to display live results from the data being recorded. The measurement recording system must have a displacement resolution of 0.5%. The loading frame shall consist of a loading rod and two sample support rods. The procedure calls for the rods to be one inch in diameter and long enough to easily support the specimen. The supporting rods shall have a span of five inches center to center. The design of the loading frame shall be substantial enough to resist any deflection during testing. The environmental chamber shall be capable of maintaining test temperature. The test procedure calls for the test to be run at 25 degrees plus or minus one degree Celsius. If the environmental chamber is external from the testing machine, the lab shall be kept as close to 25 degrees as possible during testing. The friction reducing membranes are placed between the support rods and specimen to allow free specimen movement during loading. The membranes can be 0.5 millimeter thick latex membranes separated by silicon grease or two Teflon sheets. Now that we have covered the equipment necessary to run the SCB test, let us look at the test procedure. The test procedure requires a minimum of 30 minutes of sample conditioning before testing can begin. The first step in setting up a specimen for testing is to set the specimen on the support rods. Remember to put your friction reducing membrane in between the specimen and the support rods to allow free movement. Verify that the specimen is level and centered in the loading frame. Some SCB loading frames come with a backplate to help with proper alignment. The backplate should be removed prior to testing. Manually move your machine to the point right before the load cell makes contact with the loading frame. Adjust your displacement measurement sensor, LVDT, to an adequate starting point. Make sure the displacement sensor is set at a point in its range that will prevent the reading from maxing out prior to the completion of the test. Re-verify the specimen is in the proper position and tear both the load cell and displacement sensor. Apply a small seating load to the specimen and then release the load. Verify your machine is set to run at 0.02 inches per minute and begin the test. The data acquisition by the measurement system should begin recording once the load cell measures 10 pounds of resistance. A reading for time, Load and displacement is recorded at a 1 Hz frequency for the duration of the test. Some testing machines allow the user to see a real-time chart of load versus time. After the specimen has reached its peak load, the specimen begins to fracture and the chart begins to indicate a decrease in load. The test may be terminated 120 seconds after the peak load has been reached. Repeat the test procedure for all 12 specimens, saving the test data in separate folders. Once all specimens have been tested, it is time to process and analyze the data. LTRC has developed an Excel spreadsheet template available for processing each test and for calculating the critical strain energy rate. Let's analyze our set of specimens tested. Depending on the test machine that you use to test SCB specimen, the data output may not look like the data we use for this tutorial. The template was developed assuming a polarity of the load cell and displacement sensor as negative. Some machines increase load readings under compression and some show negative values during compression. If your peak load and peak deformation readings are positive, simply reverse the value in Excel before transferring them into the template. In the Microsoft Excel SCB template, the first sheet is an instruction sheet. Take the time to read through it the first few times you run the SCB test. Begin with the specimens tested at the 25.4 millimeter notch depth. Convert your load readings and displacement readings to negative values and simply copy and paste the values into the template. Make sure to identify the samples at the top of each page. Repeat the process for all 12 specimens. Open the raw data file. Convert your load and displacement to negative if needed.
copy the values, and paste the data into the proper field in the template. Once complete, each of the three notch tabs will have four sets of raw data. After transferring the loads and deformation readings into the template, the next sheet tabs are individual charts for each specimen. Each specimen chart should have a defined peak and have at least 120 readings beyond the peak. A polynomial fit is applied to the data to reduce electrical noise. The standard degree of polynomial should be set to 6 and the points over peak set to 100. These values can be adjusted to achieve a better fit. An R-square value of 0.995 or better is desired. If the fit line does not follow the test data trend, adjust the degree of polynomial upwards until the R-square value is suitable. If your data beyond the peak has a sharp tail or curve at the end, adjust the points over peak setting. Repeat this process for the remaining specimens. The three tabs following the individual charts group the charts data of each specimen together for a given notch. These charts are helpful in quickly identifying potential outliers. In a perfect world, all four specimens will have the same peak at the same deformation. In reality, aggregate orientation or notch and sample variations play a big factor in the test results. After looking at the three group charts, the last sheet tab is the JC page. JC is the abbreviation for the critical strain energy rate. This is the page that combines the individual results and calculates the JC. The section we will focus on is the integration section. You can see the individual specimen results for peak load in kilonewtons, peak displacement in millimeters, the area under the curve, thickness, and area divided by thickness. The average for each notch depth is listed along with the standard deviation and percent coefficient of variation. If you were to notice an outlier on your notch depth combined charts, or if a notch depth's percent coefficient of variation is greater than 20%, individual specimens can be omitted from the final calculation. Simply go to the potential outlier and select omit from the drop down list. The R square value on the final JC table and chart should be above 0.95 to be considered a reliable test. Additional samples may need to be tested in order to successfully complete the SCB test and calculations. If you have any questions concerning the SCB test, template, or calculations, please contact Samuel Cooper III at 225-767-9164 or by email samuel.cooper3 at la.gov.